most welcome to Historia Spanela, History Reconnaissance, and Backdoor to Italy. Join us for the less known story of the Allied landings in Anzio in German occupied Italy in January 1944 and the five months of fighting that followed. A battle involving 300,000 men concentrated into a small, heavily contested bridgehead. It was the scene of intense fighting and periods of stalemate. It was fought with infantry tanks, artillery mortars, heavy naval guns and giant railway guns. And please, like, share and subscribe. It means a lot to us. Oh boy, you talk about your bad country. I mean, they didn't have but two directions over there. Up the hill and down the hill. On July 9, 1943, the Allies invaded Sicily. And on August 17, the island was entirely in their hands. Less than a month later, British forces landed in the south of mainland Italy. The advance to the north by American and British and Allied forces was slow and mocked by the Germans to be slower than that of a snail. The Germans took advantage of the difficult terrain, blew up bridges and used a number of defensive lines as delaying tactics. Ah, the enemy really knew his job. When those people blew a bridge, we had to start over from scratch. Some of our guys stayed wet so long their skin puckered up like a prune. We didn't get a lot of help from the weather either, as I remember. In 1943, it was one of our strategic aims to draw as many German forces as possible away from the Russian front and French coastal areas and to contain them on the Italian peninsula while liberating as much of Italy as might be possible with the means at our disposal. By the end of 1943, the Allied advance had bogged down. In the winter of 1943-44, the US 5th Army and the British 8th was held up in front of the German Gustav Line, stretching across the Italian peninsula from west to east. In January 1944, an operation was underway to bypass this line. The back door for this was Anzio, 50 kilometers south of Rome. There was a shortage of LSTs, landing ship tank. Only 38 were available for the sea lift. Thus, only two divisions could land in the first wave, a dangerously small force. Two more to come on the second trip. It was a gamble, but it had to be taken. January 21st, 1944. The task force was moving towards Anzio. Two experienced divisions was on board, waiting to hit the beaches first. The British 1st Infantry and the American 3rd. By the time it got light on the 22nd, we were already putting people on the beach. I made the Salerno landing before, and I was all set in my mind for this to be just as bad. I kept waiting for them to open up with the heavy stuff. But it didn't happen. I didn't get it. But I sure wasn't complaining. The landings was almost unopposed. The Germans had withdrawn their reserve divisions south to the casino front, and they had also called off their 24-hour coast watch the night before. The surprise was complete for the Germans. Unfortunately for the Allies, they did not know it. The only real trouble we got that day was from the air. But they only had something like 350 planes in the whole area. We had about 2,000. So they couldn't do too much. Still, at the time, it seemed like enough. Despite the air attacks, losses were light, and 90% of the landing forces made it ashore the first day. The beachhead was secured, 
embracing for the expected German counterattack. Since the German reserve divisions was on the casino front, they only had small units at their disposal, but they made good use of them. When the Allies slowly expanded the beachhead, the Germans shifted forces from northern Italy, southern France and even from the Balkans. German strengths grew day by day as the Allied casualties in the beachhead increased. At the same time, the Allies failed to breach the Gustav Line in the south, so an early relief from that direction was not to be expected. Now, the Germans launched massive attacks against the Allied beachhead, and every available resource was marshaled to meet it. Massive firepower was used to halt the German onslaught. By the end of January, we had taken a total of 3,000 casualties. As a statistic, that's a straightforward figure. The mind may accept it without distress. The thing that must be remembered is this. The statistic refers to 30 times 100 human beings hurt or killed. By now, everybody was used to living in holes. Anyway, as used to it as you can get. When we could, we'd put in the time on improvements. We used to say we had all the comforts of home provided you lived in a muddy hole in the ground back home. It was by no means a quiet stalemate, courtesy of Anciani. The German railway gun, or actually there were two guns called Robert and Leopold by their German crews, hurling giant shells into every corner of the beachhead. I don't know. Sometimes you gotta get a different slant before you really see a thing. But you know what I mean. I mean, I heard the guns going every night. Sure, but till I got on this brass salvage detail one day, it never really hit me how much of what was going on was going on. I mean, it made you wonder how there was any mountains left, much less, you know, little stuff like houses and people. I tell you, you should have seen all that brass. After our field hospital had been bombed and shelled a few times, we decided to take steps. We couldn't go entirely underground, so we did the next best thing and built strong revetments into which the tents could be put. We nurses helped where we could. It was a huge job, but it was necessary. We'd been shelled so often, we came to be called Hell's Half Acre. In fact, some line soldiers would actually hide small wounds rather than risk being sent over here. I'm not making this up. It actually happened. The old man called it a battle sled. And that was pretty accurate. 
All it was, uh, you had a bunch of foxholes, only they were steel and rigged up for towing behind a tank. That way, a squad of guys could stay in their holes for cover and move up at the same time. It's pretty neat. It never caught on, but in my book, it was a good idea. May 23rd, 1944. The Anzio breakout begins. The end of the stalemate at Anzio and of the beachhead itself. Finally, on the road to Rome. General Mark Clark's decision to take Rome after the breakout instead of cutting off the German 10th Army was heavily criticized. This was allegedly against the orders of his superior British General Harold Alexander, and it allowed the Germans to join the rest of their army group further north. That's all folks. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.